show. But let's move on because the Winter Olympics is nearly upon us and there is a massive drug scandal brewing even before the whole thing starts. Uh, it appears as if it is now the uh, International Olympic Committee versus the uh, Court of Arbitration for Sport. Uh, Ross Tucker is on the line from South Africa to talk us through what is one of the biggest messes um, that I can ever remember in anti-doping history. And we, we've seen some pretty big messes in anti-doping history. Ross, just to maybe bring us up to speed, what is the latest situation? Yeah, I'll, I'll try. It's difficult to keep track of what's happening, actually. Um, it seems as though, right, you'll recall that in December last year, the IOC banned 39 Russian athletes on the basis of a number of different investigations, one of which was the McLaren report, uh, where they uncovered evidence of systematic doping in Russia at the Sochi Olympics back in 2014. So having been banned, those athletes then appealed to the Court of Arbitration for Sport. Their bans were overturned because the courts ruled that there was insufficient evidence that those athletes had committed anti-doping violations. The IOC in response said, well, fine, you can unban them, but we're still not inviting them to the Olympics. And so now there's a group, I think I saw this morning, of 15 of those Russian Olympic athletes are taking the IOC back to the Court of Arbitration. And they are, you can imagine, very hastily convening an emergency meeting or hearing so that they can review the cases of those 15 athletes. And so it's a back and forth between the IOC and the Court of Arbitration for Sport at this stage, condensed into far too short a time. I mean, it's not like this wasn't obviously going to happen, but it's all playing out three or four days before the event starts. What does it fundamentally mean for people's ability to believe in the anti-doping process? Oh, well, there's none. There's no, there's no capital left in anti-doping, in my opinion. And you know, when you introduced the segment, you said it's it's a, a doping scandal brewing. This is a slow cooker. This thing's been brewing for four years. Like when you think in 2016, just before the Olympic Games in Rio, the same discussion was being held around whether the IOC should ban Russia from competing at those Olympic Games. And now two years later, we make it all the way to December, We've got six weeks till the Olympic Games, and they still hadn't reached a decision. And then they reached the decision, and now it's a spat between the IOC and the Court of Arbitration. So there's very little confidence. No one knows who's in control. No one even knows who's to blame. The IOC blames the Court of Arbitration. The Court of Arbitration is blaming the IOC. WADA, in the meantime, is blaming everyone. It's very difficult to know who to trust in this, and there's no, there's very little credibility. You're going to have minimum of 169 Russian athletes, probably more, because I think these 15 will win this case. And they're competing basically as Russian athletes, if not by name, then in every other way. And how can you trust that team? But then comes the other issue is that that's, that's Russia. Now we have to believe that they're the only ones? Of course not. So it's very difficult to watch any sport at this stage with any belief in what you're seeing having integrity, you know? From the Court of Arbitration and Sports findings last week, was there any, were they making a judgment on what they believed was the credibility of Grigory Rachenkov, or were they just making um, a, a procedural point that the ban that the IOC handed down was incorrect from a legal perspective? That's a good question, and I'll be honest, I don't know the answer to that, because the, when the Court of Arbitration for Sport reaches these decisions, they issue what's called a reasoned decision, which explains in detail how they arrived at the, at the decision they made. Those reasoned decisions aren't available yet. Even the IOC apparently hasn't seen them, or at least Thomas Bach hasn't seen them, if he's to be believed. So we don't actually know. But what it seems has happened is that the, the Court of Arbitration has evaluated every single one of those cases independently. And they've asked, is there sufficient evidence for this athlete, athlete one, athlete two, athlete three? And they've decided that in, in, the, in the case of 29 of those athletes, there wasn't sufficient evidence. Now, the argument that Rachenkov's lawyer is making, and he's, he's, they issued a press release. There's an article came out yesterday in the Washington Post. He's basically saying that they should have been able to ban the Russians based on the, the, the now fairly well-established wholesale evidence of a, a global systematic doping program that was going on. But it seems as though Ruchenkov is coming from the perspective of all the Russians were doping. I know this because I'm the one who did it. Whereas the Court of Arbitration is saying, prove to us that each individual athlete was doping. And that seems to be where the tension exists. But only the, only the reasoned decisions will, will provide the specific answers to that. 
Ross, did you feel that the initial process of banning these athletes was a little bit problematic because there was life bans handed out? Because it certainly seemed to me that the implementation of life bans and people who were for that argument, that, that took a huge blow last week with this decision from the CAS. Right, and there's precedent for life bans being chucked out by the CAS because in ahead of, I think it was, I've lost track of time now, but I think it was the London Olympic Games, the UK anti-doping agency tried to ban a couple of their own athletes from competing in the Olympics. So that's not a life ban from all sport, it's just an Olympic ban, and that was tossed out as well. So, so yeah, I do think that was problematic. They were never going to get away with a, a complete ban from the Olympic Games, especially announcing it in December and then having to argue their case within the next month. Is there a solution to that, maybe in an eight-year ban for cases, because it's effectively a life ban by the time you come back eight years later, most of the impact of the drugs that you've been taking should have worn off. Is there, I, like, um, we're really clutching the straws here and, and deal with um, minor points around the edges, but is there some way that we can start to navigate some pathway through this type of stuff? Uh, yeah, as you say, changing the length of the van is, is slapping a coat of paint on a dilapidated building a little bit because in the end, the problem was not the ban length. It was the fact that they couldn't catch these guys in the first place. And now we've seen an overreaction maybe to that. I would say six to eight years would be fine. I mean, you know, four years ago, it was a two-year ban. And they've increased it to four. So I guess that was progress. But it's not a deterrent. <laughs> the size of the punishment is not a deterrent if there's no chance of the punishment ever being received. So <laughs> that, to me, is a bigger problem. So I think... I think anti-doping needs a structural overhaul and it needs, I think, three things. One is much more transparency. Two is they have to get rid of the numerous conflicts of interest. I mean, what this, what last week has shown is how many potential conflicts of interest there are that need to be navigated. And that, that applies to national governing bodies, anti-doping agencies who have to effectively police themselves. I don't think that's trustworthy and that's been shown for years. And then the final one is is better investigation. I mean, how many times have we seen in the last decade that the media are the ones who blow the story open in anti-doping and then WADA and the IOC or the IAAF or whoever it is, they get dragged along behind the media story and that seems to me to be backwards. So I think they have to change those three things and that, that requires a complete overhaul in anti-doping, which where's the appetite to do that? You're asking turkeys to vote for Christmas, basically. It's not going to happen. So what it needs to be broken apart and the constituent parts removed from any influence of the businesses that actually run it and the businesses that run it are the governing bodies and the uh, big sports competitions and the businesses that run them are ultimately the sponsors. Uh, that, that link needs to be broken somehow and then mm -hmm. a new organisation set up that has credibility. Like it, it, it feels pie in the sky at the moment. It, it, it is, because the key thing that would bind all those stakeholders together is, is the idea of who's got the incentive to catch doping or to, to eradicate doping. At the moment, no one. And so even, even Richard Pound, who was in the news yesterday because he criticized the IOC's handling of the, of the case and then was himself attacked by his own IOC colleagues, which tells you about the tension and the conflict within the IOC, but Richard Pound was the first head of WADA, the World Anti-Doping Agency, and he's on record saying that there's no appetite to successfully undertake an anti-doping program. So in the absence of appetite, you know, we always say where there's a will, there's a way. The, the reality is there's no will because until they can figure out how to incentivize actually catching doping as opposed to letting it go by, this how, how would you ever, no matter what you put together, the structure, the concepts, the strategy, none of it will work because there's no desire to actually make it work. You mentioned Rodchenkov's lawyer there. We had him on the show a couple of weeks ago, Jim Walden, and he said there's a lot more to come from Grigory Rodchenkov. But at this point, with Rodchenkov's evidence, with the McLaren report, it seems like the legacy of that report and of Icarus and the likes has been completely destroyed as a result of the events of the last week, that we thought that this was a seminal moment in anti-doping and that WAD would take this up and lead the fight at long last. But this just hasn't happened. In fact, the opposite has occurred. Yeah, exactly. And so yesterday I saw the, the Water Athletes Commission have called for strong leadership. It's, you know, it's been two and a half years now since the McLaren report came out. And that was the moment for strong leadership on the part of the IOC, perhaps Water. And, and I'm, 
You know, Watt has been accused of being basically a, a public relations body who was put there to make it look like anti-doping was happening. I think in some respects that's a little bit harsh, but you also look at some of the responses to the Russian scandal from the very top of WADA and you think to yourself, well, they, they clearly didn't want this. It fell into their lap like a, you know, a burning hot potato and it's been passed about as much as possible, but no one's actually done anything to to own a change that will come out of this. So you're exactly right. The, the opportunity has been lost. And where there was a chance to potentially regain some credibility by showing strong leadership, they've undermined it even further through not showing any at all. Uh, in the meantime, cycling obviously has, uh, you know, it's really got its stuff together on this stuff. And um, Chris Froome, the most famous and most successful cyclist in the world, um, ends up with a positive test and yet Next week, he's going to be back in the in the saddle. They deny it's a positive test, but certainly that's how it's been reported. Yes, and with no... What I find most bizarre about this is that there has been no commitment to a, a end of the process. I, I can't understand why they couldn't say at the moment that the test was announced or, or leaked. This is another example of the media dragging the, the situation into the public eye. Why couldn't you say at that moment that on the 16th of February or March, whatever it is, the hearing will be held and we will make a decision? It, it's just in, in the vacuum that's created by that lack of clarity, we now have all this uncertainty. So, so Froome will go off and race a couple of races. Maybe he'll even make it to the start line of the Giro. Maybe he'll even defend his tour title. And then possibly in August this year, we'll finally resolve a situation that's been hanging over for 10 months. It's, it's actually ludicrous because... Maybe, maybe he, he's able to prove something that shows that he didn't cheat to get twice the, the loud level of salbutamol, in which case there'll be no ban and everyone can breathe a sigh of relief. But, relief. but if they show, if they give him a nine-month ban, then that would have started in September last year and everything that he did between September and June this year will have to be wiped off. And you, you, you know it could happen as you're watching. So how can you... How can you believe that result if Froome's on top of both podiums in those Grand Tours and there's a better than likely chance he's going to have that result taken away? It's, it's untenable. Would it always be retrospective? Is there no way that they go from the day that we find the adverse finding or we, we find that you know you need to serve a nine-month ban, that it's from that day forward and so actually all he misses is the winter and the first three months of next year and everybody is actually technically happy with that because the tour result will stand, the Giro result will stand and he'll be fit to come back to try and win five next year. That, that, that could be the way they fudge it, you're right. I, I've not seen them do that before. Normally it's from the moment of that positive test and they, and they retrospectively ban you then that, that way. But that, that might be the way to do it. But even there, now you've if he's banned, then it means what? It means that there was evidence that he was either negligent or worst case, I guess, for him, would be deliberately doping in the Vuelta last year. So now you've got a convicted doper going on to win the next two big tours that he rides in potentially. And how's, how's that good for the credibility of the sport? Because now he's a known doper. So no matter how it goes, unless he's able to provide the evidence to show that he was completely innocent, there is no scenario here where cycling ends up looking good, even if they fudge it that way. I haven't paid enough attention to um, his social media feeds over the years, but it seemed that the, was it a Strava um, detail that came out recently of like a seven and a half hour ride around South Africa? That was one of the first times that we had seen him go, oh look, I'm out in a training spin, everybody, I'm doing this level of training at this point. Um, it, there was some speculation that that was part of them trying to recreate conditions where um, they might be able to somehow synthesize the twice the level of salbutamol in the system. Is, is there any credence given to that theory that's uh, doing the rounds at the minute? Uh, who knows? It seems, it seems plausible that that's what he's done because he has to do that. He's got to, he's got to figure out a way to, <laughs> to reproduce what happens in the third week of a Grand Tour. So he, he's, and he's posted, as you say, a few of those rides. He, he could be trying to do that. From the sounds of what's come out, he has to show how a combination of extreme exertion plus dehydration plus fatigue could cause these elevated levels given supposedly a kidney condition. So somehow it's, <laughs> somehow it's got to trigger a repeat of a kidney condition and then recreate all the, uh, all the surrounding contextual circumstances. And 
And yeah, I mean, I'd, maybe maybe Froome does that every January, goes on these 45 kilometer an hour, seven hour epic rides. But if not, then he's 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 trying to do that now. And again, coming back to what I said earlier, I, I find it completely bizarre that you have and what seems to be an indefinite period of time to try and figure out how you're going to prove your innocence. Like, basically, from the moment he was told that there was this positive test, he's he's been able to go away and just basically take one shot after another and trying to recreate it until eventually he, he does so, and then he can go to the court. I, to me, you should you should have to offer maybe not a detailed explanation, but some kind of theory for what happened, and then in a controlled circumstance, recreate that. At the moment, it's just machine gun fire until he eventually lands on one that seems plausible. It's it's just to me, it's a bizarre process. Ross, let's create an alternate reality here where you're a physiologist for Team Sky and it is your job to protect Chris Froome to the very end of his career. What are you going to say to this fictitious hearing that may or may not happen to defend Chris Froome? How can you defend twice the level of salbutamol in one, in one system? Well, I mean, if the, so the hearing has to happen. I mean, if they, if they in, delay it indefinitely, there's a big problem. So I would go to that hearing and I would, I would do pretty much what they're trying to do. They've got to show that he's a one in a million and that would have to require that he's got some kidney condition that appeared on that specific day. So he would have to go there and provide supporting evidence. He would have, first of all, you'd have to argue that he took the maximum allowed dose. So in other words, as you may know, the, the guidelines allow you to take a certain amount over 12 hours. It's 800 micrograms and 1,600 over 24 He's got to build an argument that says, I took it at exactly this time and then here and here and here to maximize that. And then he would have to go and test himself under the most extreme dehydration and so on possible until he can try and recreate something as close to that value that he got as possible. And then he would have to try and say to them, now you see, because he's not going to get it in a lab. It's, it's to me impossible. He's never going to get to 2,000. Maybe he can get to 1,100, 1,200. There's some... There's about four scientific studies that have done something similar, and that's the limit to what they can get. And then he's got to find an explanation for the next, so call it 800, and that will be the, the kidney malfunction. So he's, he's, he, he, can, he can go so far using the recreation, I think, and then he's got to bridge that gap using a theoretical argument. And that theoretical argument will be, as I say, kidneys, and he will have to try and discredit the previous research. So I think that what they will do is they will bring in renal specialists and other pharmacology experts who basically attack and undermine the research on which that threshold is set. And they will try and argue that that threshold should be 2,000, not 1,000 as it currently stands. Wow, a, a grim and dismal uh, vista spreads out before us for the next God knows how long period of time. Uh, obviously, the other thing that he needs is um, a bunch of journalists who are ready to interview him, and then he has to take some puffs of the inhaler just before he does that interview to fully replicate exactly the conditions of what happened at the Vuelta, because that's 100% believable too. Um, I wanted to ask you before we let you go here, Ross, about um, Paula Radcliffe and uh, the Twitter spat that you've been involved in with her over the last <laughs> couple of days. This is really interesting to me because um, I would have assumed that if you're Paula Radcliffe, you kind of want to just make sure that um, people forget about uh, a bunch of things that have happened in her career. The adverse results that um, came out on that were leaked as part of her um, blood passport or biological passport, rather. You know, it's it's not great to draw attention to that if you are Paula Radcliffe. It's not great to kind of have that as part of your history and the, the, her holding the sign up. Um, and then to start arguing with people on Twitter about anti-doping. Yes, <laughs> no, it's, it, I agree. Um, and I, I, I wouldn't want to speculate why she's doing that because I'm, I'm with you. I'd, I'd, I'd be flying as low under the radar as I possibly could. For me, the issue is this, and this is the background to the story, as you say, is that a number of years ago, the Sunday Times got hold of a number of blood values from Paula Radcliffe. And independent experts, anti-doping experts, had looked at those and said that they were extremely suspicious and highly suggestive of doping. Her argument was that there was context and explanations around when the samples were taken, the circumstances, she'd gone to altitude, she was dehydrated and so forth. Then it came out that there were additional samples of Paula Radcliffe's which hadn't been released to the media. And that when she gave the totality of her blood samples to other independent experts, they exonerated her and said, there's nothing to see here. Now, fine. 
The point is that if, if that's the case and you have all this data that exonerates you, then be open about it and be transparent. And in my opinion, when people call for transparency and point the finger and are outspoken against the doping of the Russians and other athletes who've cheated them, but they're unwilling to accept the calls and the requests for transparency and openness themselves, then that, for me, needs to be called out. It's not to say that her failure to publish her own data incriminates her as a definite doper, but it just seems to me unusual when people are asking for it, you are arguing that it completely exonerates you, then put it out there. You don't even, don't even give it to me. I, it doesn't need to be me or anyone else on Twitter. But just put out there the independent report and the independent evaluation of the total of your blood samples so that people can see that you've got nothing to hide. Because as we've said, this whole discussion is about the lack of credibility in anti-doping and in the authorities who are tasked with it. So this appeal to high authority is worth very little. Transparency, on the other hand, in my opinion, would be worth a great deal. So we, we just put our tweet up there and the, the central argument from Paula Radcliffe's side, and I should make this just to, to make sure that we can address the point, is that she believes that releasing the rest of the data, and I'll read it here, releasing the rest of the data might have protected my reputation, but at the cost of undermining and weakening the ABP. I'm not prepared to facilitate cheats evading punishment. Basically, the case that she's making is that by showing where you can get these high values that look like they're characteristic of a doper, if you can show that there is uh, stuff around that, then there might be a template there for dopers to manipulate the biological passport. That's the case she's making. Is that a yeah. fair summation? In my opinion, no. In my opinion, the, the, the biological passport is, is better the more data you have and becomes more and more difficult as, as it becomes more and more robust and rigorous. And it's not as though elite athletes don't know how to microdose. They know how to manipulate the levels of the various blood values that are being measured using a combination, a little bit of EPO, a little bit of blood transfusion. They know what happens at altitude. They know exactly how to make those adjustments. So the, the data from one athlete is not going to give a toolkit for how to avoid biological passport detection. In my, to me, that was a completely spurious argument. And it's actually the one that irks me more because it's, it's almost like I'm being noble here, taking a hit to my reputation so that other cheats can't get away with it. And I, it's simply beyond me how that would happen. If I'm missing something and if other people are missing something, then I think there's value in having that discussion. In other words, tell us how <laughs> athletes' biological passport data can help cheats get away with doping. Tell us how that would happen, but the, the she, she just she wants to almost sort of have a sort of eat her cake and then have it too, you know. Like so, if I did this, it would help athletes dope, but I'm not going to tell you how, and I'm not going to tell you what mine said. So now leave me alone and just have faith. And that, to me, in sport, there's no such thing as faith anymore. You said uh, eat her cake and have it too. That's a quote from the Unibomber documentary or series on um, Netflix at the minute. I don't know if you're watching it or if that was uh, on purpose or. It it, it, was, it wasn't. I, okay, yeah, I right. heard it elsewhere, but you should I, dig it out. Yeah. You like it, I think. Um, okay. On on the Radcliffe point, and um, like, where does that go from here? If she was to release her data, then there would be information in the public domain that we would all be able to see. And suddenly, her positive or her um, not positive, but her her samples that had those higher values there might be context for them and that might be something that people could then kind of say okay we we understand why that happened um that is the case in, in some instances in the biological passport right yeah yeah exactly so what could happen she's going to have elevated off scores and this is the technical stuff on the passport but she's going to have higher red blood cell count her reticular sites will maybe be lower and it, those things are suggestive of blood doping or EP, whatever it is but we also she, she could show that this was a period that she was at altitude, she was dehydrated there, so we'd expect to see certain changes. So, so again, coming back to her argument, what would, we, what would we discover? That dehydration affects the value? We knew that. That altitude affects it? We know. There's very little that would be discoverable from her biological passport that would help prospective cheats in the future. But what there would be, would be contextual evidence plus a whole lot more values than we saw before. Because before, I think we saw five or six Presumably now there'll be 10, 20 of them. And as I say, the, the biological passport improves with more data. So if anything, putting it out there improves the rigor and the robustness of that passport. And she would be able to argue to the 
the doubters that there was nothing to answer for. Now, on that, my, my impression of this whole anti-doping world is that there's a la large and growing population of cynics who believe doping is happening no matter what. Then there's a, a group of people on the other extreme who are the believers who don't believe there's doping and they think things are far better than they are. And then there's a group in the middle who are perhaps not on the fence, but they can be swayed in one direction or another. Now, if you withhold information, all you're doing is you're entrenching the two sides of the debate, but you never speak to the group in the middle, whereas transparency would potentially shift people towards belief. You're never going to change the cynics, whether it's 30% of people who will never believe you. It doesn't matter what you do, they won't believe. But if you don't put something out there, there's a whole group in the middle that will also start to doubt you because it looks like you have something to hide. And this, by the way, is not unique to Paula Radcliffe. There's a South African triathlete got third in the Olympics in, in Rio called Henry Skumon. And he was named two, three weeks ago in the Fancy Bears League, the latest of those. And the same situation for him. He may well have a plausible explanation for why he was taking a corticosteroid. But at the moment, because no one's explaining it, it looks like something's being covered up. And so to me, again, transparency matters, whether it's Skumon or Radcliffe or cyclists or Kenyan marathon runners, whatever it is. Just put the, put the information out there and let people see that you have nothing to hide. Uh, just one last quick one for me, Ross. Which do you think is more likely to happen in the near future? A man running a sub two hour marathon or a woman breaking Paula Radcliffe, Radcliffe's marathon record? <laughs> That's a very good question. Uh, before last year, I would have said the sub two marathon, but then Mary Katani went to London and scared Radcliffe's record. When I say scared, I mean, she's still a minute or so off it, but it's, it's closer now than it was. It's clo we're closer to the women's world record than we are to sub two. That said, other than Katani, I don't see anyone else going there. So at, at this point, I would still lean towards a sub two hour marathon compared to Paula Radcliffe's uh, 2.15.25. I think that one will last longer. One last point, Jack Anderson, um, the uh, lawyer who's now based in Australia and who um, is an anti-doping expert as well, says um, we were just tweeting out comments, bits of it, about how um, the ban was always likely to be overturned um, by the Court of Arbitration for Sport. Jack makes the point that the... Um, International Paralympic Committee imposed a stringent ban on Russia, which was upheld at the Court of Arbitration for Sports, and the IOC chose not to do the same thing that the Paralympic Committee did, which in and of itself suggests there is a pathway by which you can have these bans upheld by the Court of Arbitration for Sport. But somehow the IOC didn't manage to do that. Yeah, so that's a actually really interesting point. Same thing happened in 2016 at the Rio Olympics, was the, the IAAF managed to ban most of the Russians, but the IOC didn't, and then the Paralympic body managed to ban all of them. So, so yeah, that's actually really interesting, and I don't know enough about the law. Maybe you should get Jack on to talk about that specifically, but um, it, it would suggest, you know, a lot of people were blaming the Court of Arbitration. That would suggest that in actual fact it was the, it was the package of evidence presented to them by the IOC that's to blame, and that, again, confirms when Richard Pound said that the IOC didn't do enough, it makes it seem like he was the one who was correct on that, and it's not Cass's fault. I should actually give Jack his full title here. Um, professor and Director of Sports Law at Melbourne Law School, Member of Court of Arbitration for Sport. So uh, he obviously knows what he's talking about with that one, and it is an interesting difference, um, and probably something that uh, I guess sheds a bit more light on why things have happened the way they have. Again, we await the reasoned decision, and um, as always, the devil will be in the detail. Ross, brilliant to have you with us this morning. Thanks a million for giving us so much of your time. No worries. Thanks, fellas. Good to chat.